around the panels, and again, you'll find lots of comics. They don't use borders, or, or uh, you know, the borders are are differently shaped, or you know, different uh, kind of iconography. But panels have borders. Gutters are the spaces between the panels. No problem there. Um, balloons. Uh, balloons contain the words with the tail pointed at the speaker. And I'm going to say a little more about balloons in a moment, but right now I just want to point out this electric word balloon here, which says that that's coming from the telephone. It's not coming from her index finger. Uh, that's the kind of thing that, you know, you, you grow up reading cartoons, you kind of take for granted that you know that, but um, you, you can't always take that for granted. And then iconography. And the only iconography I've really got going on this, in this cartoon are those speed lines from the uh, car. And again, that's something that... Um, that, well, I'll give you this in a minute, but it's, it, it can be culturally dependent. You have to be careful, not assuming everybody understands your comics iconography. And there's room for creativity in inventing your, new, your own iconography. It goes both ways. Um, these are just some examples of different word balloons, um, speech balloons, shouting balloons, whispering balloons. There's an electronic balloon, and then I made up a little thought balloon over in the corner, the little, little balloons with the, uh, you know, the little thought bubbles coming out of it. Um, there are some people in the comics world who will rip your throat out if you call them bubbles instead of balloons. I'm not one of those people. But, um, and iconography. Iconography is the graphic shorthand that can be, conveys meaning without words. You know, sweat drops, speed lines, pain stars, um, little curly cues. Uh, Mort Walker, the cartoonist who uh, created Beetle Bailey, wrote a whole book, and it, mostly in jest, but uh, kind of cataloging all these, all these icons uh, that, that he used in his comic work. Um, and again, uh, these are sometimes culturally dependent. These don't always translate well. We think of comics as universal language, but they don't always translate well. I mean, I remember when I was first kind of trying to figure out what manga was all about. I couldn't figure out why everybody always had these waffle patterns on their forehead. What, what's a waffle? And it, because it's like the veins in their forehead bulging. But it was a Japanese thing. I just, I, yeah, somebody had to explain that to me. It's like, what's, what's that checkerboard up there? Well, they're angry. Okay, I get it. Everybody in Japan got that. I, I wasn't smart enough to get that. But, you know, like I say, some, some of these things cross borders, some of them don't. So I'm going to run down a list, again, of, of materials that I use to create my comics. So I've got a, I've got a, a drawing board, I've got uh, different kinds of paper, Bristol board, I've got a paper cutter, I've got Indian ink and brushes and dip pens. I've got uh, pencils, a blue pencil and a lead pencil and different kinds of pens and different kinds of erasers and whiteout. I've got tape and a ruler and some templates and a triangle. I've got, I bought a new triangle. I'm so excited about a 45 degree triangle. I've got a light box for tracing things. I've got a big flatbed scanner for scanning things. I've got Photoshop. I've got a Wacom tablet and a pen and a mouse. And that's all you need to be a cartoonist. <laughs> that's all you need. You need paper and something to make a mark on paper with. That's all you need. You don't need any of that other crap. Um, I have friends, in fact, I talked to a friend last week who makes a, a great upper middle class living cartooning for magazines using nothing but cheap printer paper and ballpoint pens. And that's his career. Very low overhead. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, because that's, that's the truth. Uh, you can buy everything you need to be a professional cartoonist at Office Depot for less than 10 bucks. That other stuff, you know, you, it might come in handy as your career develops or as your style or technique develops. But, but this is all you need and this is, this is what I love about comics is the barriers to entry are so incredibly low. Uh, it's so egalitarian. Uh, money is not a barrier. Sex is not a barrier. Age and race are not barriers, particularly these days. There are, they have been in the past. There were times when a woman couldn't get hired as a cartoonist because nobody thought women were funny. But these days, you know, it's all internet. It's all anonymous. You send things off. They don't know who you are. They don't know how old you are. They don't know anything about you. All they do is look at the stuff and see if it's what they want or not, if it's good or not. Um, it's, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's just tremendously populist and egalitarian. Um, and, and I think that fact, that the fact that what matters in comics is what you have to say and how well you say it, is what makes comics an ideal medium for telling your stories or helping other people tell theirs. So I, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about some, some, some of the things I think about when I'm making comics and what I think make comics special. Um, comics, I think, is a good medium for people who wouldn't necessarily otherwise write. Like, uh, you know, perhaps you write a journal, perhaps you keep a diary, perhaps you write essays. 
A lot of people aren't comfortable doing that. They don't feel like they're good writers. Um, but everybody can draw a little frowny face and say, like I drew in my picture of my mother in the chair, say, this is how I felt that day. You know, I felt sad today. That was a bad day. That's, that that could be a journal entry. And maybe if you put a little word balloon on it or a little Catherine Tell little story, you've written yourself a comic about your day. Um, comics allow the creator to, to play with words and pictures or play words against pictures in a way no other medium can. And they're especially good at metaphor. Uh, for example, in Mom's Cancer, I could uh, illustrate my mother's condition by drawing her as the character in the old Operation Board game. Except instead of, you know, writer's elbow or water on the ear or whatever, she had water on the lung and she had lung cancer and she had a brain tumor. Uh, this is a two-page spread that is, I, I will line them up here. And, you know, and, and, and instead of the cards you pick up, she had symptoms and treatments and symptoms and treatments and you repeat until better or dead. Um, so I, I get to use this metaphor, and everybody who's played that game understands that metaphor, uh, except instead of operation, it's inoperable. Um, I could portray my mother's point of view of her treatment as she saw it. Uh, I think, I, if I remember right, she literally said one day that after we'd gone to her radiation therapy that it was like being in Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. And of course it was nothing like Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. It was a modern hospital, clean, antiseptic, white. You know, it's like walking in 2001 Space Odyssey. But I could draw what she felt that day was like to her. I could draw my mother getting her treatment in Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. Um, I also, as I scripted Mom's Cancer, I remember writing a, a piece that said, um, balancing the, mom, the medications Mom took was like walking a tightrope, which is, which is awful writing. That's a cliche metaphor. It's, it's, it's uh, clumsy and, and awful. I couldn't figure out, it's bad writing. I couldn't figure out how to illustrate it. So instead of writing that, balancing Ma's medication with like walking a tightrope, I can draw it. And then you see what I'm able to do here is I can draw my mom walking the tightrope without mentioning it in the words. And so that clears up the words. I can use the words to have a very dry description of, you know, the medication she's on and the treatment she's under, which would be in itself boring as, as text. But you get to juxtapose it, contrast it with this ridiculous situation of my mother walking a tightrope when as things just go from bad to worse to hell. You know, she got a buzzard on her pole, and then all of a sudden she finds out she's over a crocodile tank, and then she got an elephant on the other end of her pole, and then a rope catches on fire. This is what it was, this is the metaphor of what this experience was like. I can draw the metaphor, I don't have to mention it in the text, so I can play the words and text against each other. Very serious text, uh, this ridiculously, again, kind of black and bleak, uh, you know, image of my mother as a tightrope walker. But again, you know, I'm able to, this very last thing, literally happened. My mom called up her doctor one day and said, my vision is blurry. What's, you know, why is my vision blurry? And they said, well, you got a brain tumor and you're on 27 different meds. Take your pick. And the others said, take your pick. And it was that kind of dismissiveness that, um, that you know, fueled this cartoon. And, and just one other thing I, I was able to do with mom's cancer and you could do is, is play with the medium a little bit. For example, in mom's cancer, most of mom's cancer is black and white, but I used the color it's like Dorothy going to the Wizard of Oz. Color in Mom's Cancer was for something that was a little fantastic, something that was a little out of the ordinary. And in this case, it's a, a birthday party for my mother that wasn't literally but could have been her last birthday. And we invited all our friends and we had a big party. And uh, that's, that's, that's Karen right there. And I know all those people in that picture. But, um, and, and so, you know, Mom was just a glow. She was, she was, she was, she was operating on a different plane than everybody else. So everybody else, in a black and white world, my mom was glowing in color that day. And I was able to show that, kind of playing with, with the medium. So with that kind of, you know, sense, I want to talk about some of the, the, the tools that go into a comic, and then we're going to start drawing some comics. I want to talk about the importance of character. Um, character is your reader's way into the story. Uh, character is someone to empathize with, that they want to succeed, or a villain they want to fail. Um, you might have a high concept comic strip that doesn't have characters, and that's great. Then you're advanced and you don't need me to tell you anything. But generally, you know, you, you're going to need to have a character that will be your reader's way into the story. Um, because comics are such abstractions in the first place, uh, it's especially important that the reader can instantly and easily always tell your characters apart at a glance. In contrast is one important way to do that. So my first advice when you're making comics would be uh, think about giving your characters different shapes, sizes, colors, postures, props. You know, ideally I always aim for someone to be able to tell my, my characters apart as silhouettes. You want each character to have a clear distinctive silhouette. 
And I have some examples of that principle in action. Uh, Laurel and Hardy is a classic. Everybody says Laurel and Hardy. It's, it's you know, the fat guy and the skinny guy. Um, the Marx Brothers. The Marx Brothers are an interesting case because they were literally brothers and they all had the same, same or similar features and the same builds. But they played with props so that, you know, you can tell Groucho from Harpo and Chico instantly. Um, and and uh, so they were able to kind of change the externality to, uh, to make themselves clear, distinct characters. Uh, Art Carney, Jackie Gleason from The Honeymooners, of course. The modern version of those guys, Chris Farley and, and David Spade. Um, Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor made several good movies together, and part of the, the success of that film was because of their contrast, uh, both physically and, and in their personalities uh, as you know, kind of expressed uh, through their physicality. Um, Penn and Teller is one of my favorite examples, magicians, if you don't know them. And, you know, Penn and Teller became partners, I'm sure, because they both said, hey, you're a great magician, you're a great magician, let's be partners. But you just know the first day they met, they said, we would look great together. You know? <laughs> Again, it's, it's the tall guy and the, and the short guy. And, and then, of course, there's those two. <laughs> Again, contrast. In comics, the same thing applies. Uh, one of the best, uh, most genius comic strips in history is Crazy Cat. This is Crazy Cat Office of Pup and Ignatz Mouse. Um, instantly identifiable, different body shapes, different body types. If they were silhouettes, you could, you could see it. You, you could tell who was who. Cattle and hops, not only different shapes and types, different species. They went different species on that. That's, that's terrific. Um, my friend Stefan Pastis does a comic strip called Pearls Before Swine, which is, is uh, Stefan is the first one who will tell you he's not a great artist. But this is genius. Look at those four characters up there. And if I blanked out all those details, you can tell them you can tell them apart. You can tell them apart. He's got a limited toolbox he works with. I mean, they all have the same sort of body shape, and they all have the, those little, you know, chicken feet and whatever. But each is a unique personality with a unique look. Um, I think that's important. And one of my favorite examples is from Scooby Doo. And the reason I like this example is because you got two girls who look completely different. You got two guys who look completely different, and then you got the big dog, but that's not important. But I love that, that, that whoever designed these characters, you know, had two girls, two guys, and you can tell them all apart, even in the dark of a haunted house. So I love that. Um, from my own work, I had a Marx Brothers problem. This is, this is a picture from Mom's Cancer. And um, this is, you know, my self-portrait of me, and, and my sister, who's a little younger than I am, she's the nurse, my mom, and my, my much younger sister. And I had the Marx Brothers problem because we're all related and we all had to kind of look like we were related, but I still wanted us to look different. And so I did some subtle things with our clothing and so forth, but, you know, just in designing the character, I was thinking about things like this. We all kind of had the same pear-shaped face, but, um, you know, my sister and I, we were, we were in our 40s and, and you know, our, our faces are kind of that shape. Uh, my mother's older than us, so hers is sagging a little more. Gravity's taking a little more toll. She doesn't have as, as firm a, a, a chin or jawline. Um, she's, she's sagging down. My younger sister, her angles are all sharper and, and uh, you know, and, and pointier. Um, our noses look like this. Mom's nose is a little bigger. Her nose is just a perky little, you know, perky little uh, triangle there. Um, my neck's thick. Mom doesn't have much of a neck. Her neck is really skinny. So these are kind of the cartooning shorthands you put in to, to think about what you, you want your character to look like, what you want them to convey, and uh, how you can tell them apart. My second book was Whatever Happened World Tomorrow, and it has characters like this in it. And again, the contrast is obvious. I've got uh, you know, a father and son, basically, Pop and Buddy. And uh, here they are on a train on their way to the 1939 World's Fair. And uh, you know, my application of, of those principles is obvious. Um, the book's kind of complicated. These guys, 